back. Welcome back for our final official, I'll say that, installment of our Gone Fishing series. In two weeks, there will be a prequel. There we go. A prequel. Next week, Charlie Farnham's going to preach. Thank you, Charlie. Yay! And I'll be on vacation all this week from this afternoon, and Reverend Thompson, Ron, will be filling in. If you have an emergency, call Ron. Well, we've talked about what it looks like to be an authentic, devoted follower of Jesus, rather than some poser who thinks that the hour they spend here on Sunday morning is all it takes to be a Christian. We've talked about developing the kind of attitude of hospitality and invitation that welcomes all people rather than judging them, knowing that none of us, none of us is without sin and we all need repentance. Today we're going to talk about our shared need that we feel for our children and our grandchildren that they too come to know the love of Christ and become followers of Jesus. How do we teach the children to fish, as it were? Well, we do things like vacation Bible school. We can help them understand what it means to have that kind of faith the kind of faith that strengthens them, both in the here and now, when we model that for them. When I was a little girl, our family went to church regularly. We were Baptists. I remember distinctly watching my father be baptized up behind the altar in the big bathtub thing with the steps on both sides. I was probably only three, and that would have made him about 25. Our little family of three got dressed up every Sunday and went to church. And I remember proudly reciting John 3.16 when my folks came to pick me up from Sunday school when I was in third grade. Church was a part of my life until my parents' marriage began to break up. When I was in sixth grade and suddenly they just stopped going. That meant I stopped going. Being just a child, I didn't understand what was going on in all those quiet conversations they had at the kitchen table. I just knew they were unhappy. But I also knew that I missed going to church and singing in the choir and seeing my friends. That was about the time that I started going to the Methodist church with my soon-to-be best friend, Sue. In the fall of seventh grade, we met. She lived just a block or two away, but we were in different classes before that, and I never had met her. Her mom and dad were faithful to always going to church every Sunday, rain or shine, good or bad, unless you were deathly ill. And you know what I mean. You always went to church. So I rode along, and I found my new church home from which I never strayed. My parents divorced, and then a few years later, they got back together again, but they never did join another church for whatever reason. I'm not quite sure, but I think it was because of something that had happened back when their marriage was on the rocks, something that that little church did that was more of a hindrance than a help to them. That's what happens sometimes. People get burned by rigid rules and bored by tedious monotony. Children were forced to fit into miniature adult molds at church, and out, the outside world looked a, like a whole lot more fun. No restrictions, no uncomfortable clothes, no one giving you the look when you got wiggly and you couldn't sit still in church. You know what I mean. We all got that look sometimes. What we were saying to children when we give that look, is in essence, you can't come and sit at Jesus' feet unless you can be perfect. And since children, especially little children, are rarely perfect in their behavior, 
you can't come sit at Jesus' feet with the rest of us. And that would make me really sad. In the book of Mark, we read this, these words from Jesus, or about Jesus. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And they took it, he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. As I pondered this passage, I wondered if someone might think that if they had not accepted Christ when they were a little child, then they were just out of luck. And no, that's not the case. It's not ever somehow too late, but I know that that's not what that sentence was intended to mean. As I consulted other translations, reading multiple versions of the Bible, I found this one that might be helpful. This is the message version of it. He wrote, the people brought children to Jesus, hoping he might touch them. The disciples shooed them off. You get the picture. He shooed, they shooed them off. But Jesus was irate and he let them know it. Don't push these little children away. Don't ever get between them and me. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very center of the life of the kingdom. Mark this, unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you'll never get in. Then gathering the children in his arms, he laid hands on them and blessed them. Unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you won't grasp the importance, the opportunity, the, the magnitude of what God is offering. Children trust the significant adults in their lives. At least we hope they've grown up in a, a situation where they've learned to be able to do that. They trust and they rely on them for guidance and as role models. If those adults shut them out of the opportunity to worship and to actively participate in this, a spiritual life that God offers them, then they never learn how much God in Christ loves them. When we do that, we're no different than the disciples who shooed the children away. Jesus wants the little children. He even said, woe to the person that leads a child astray that there was a millstone and some deep water of body, body of water fit for that person. We don't want to be that kind of person, do we? We want to create an atmosphere where our children feel welcome, where learning from it is the significant adults in their lives what it looks like to worship, to pray, and to face the trials of life with faith rather than fear. The book of Proverbs some of which you just heard, tells us that if we've done this well, if we've done this well, the child may explore and wander, but he or she will come back. They'll come back to God because they have that sure and certain foundation in their life upon which to build. My mother used to tell me, do as I say, not as I do. I never did like that saying much. Mostly she did, she said that to me because she didn't want me to smoke. She smoked cigarettes and she didn't want me ever to start. And I didn't, but not because she told me not to. I never did because I wanted to be like my grandma Leota who never had smoked either. Positive role models are much more compelling than negative ones. The negative ones motivate us to go in the opposite direction, but they don't help us be able to envision to know what to do, only not what not to do. As faithful Christians, 
we model for our children and our grandchildren what it looks like to be a faithful disciple of Jesus, even if they don't know what the word disciple means, even if you don't know what that word means. If you're following in just Jesus' footsteps, you're being a disciple. If they see us going to church and making decisions in our lives based on our Christian values, then they will see what to do and how to do it as an adult. Where we've fallen down in the last 50 years is in claiming our faith in Christ as the why we do the good things that we do. We must claim it and name it. The world has been saying that doing good things is all that is needed. You just need to be a good person. One can be a good person by being ethical, kind, loyal, and of good character, according to humanist standards. But according to religious standards, we can only achieve maximum potential when we put our faith in Christ and access the Spirit, that power of the Holy Spirit, to enable us to be more than, more, way more than anything a lone human being could ever achieve through their own willpower. Together with Christ, we can attain redemption and salvation, which you can't get unless you place your faith in him, and move forward toward that Christian perfection that we were talking about last week. Without Christ, our acts of kindness are random and sporadic and usually done just to make ourselves feel good. With Christ, we are motivated to sacrificial acts of service in the name of Christ, things that will change lives, both our own and the lives of other people. With Christ, we're empowered in ways to create community where people, people are no longer lonely. They're no longer hungry because we're feeding them. And the Spirit of Christ is among us. We love the unlovable, and we find ways to live together in peace. We share. We share so that everyone has enough to live. We stay connected to God in prayer and in worship for inspiration and refueling of our courage and strength. As we traverse through life's storms, we are never alone. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what our children will see as we go through life. Children listen, they hear, they learn from everything we say and do. They don't miss a trick, even when we wish they would. They learn from everything. They feel everything too. There's two things, visitors and children can feel tension in the room just like I felt the tension as my parents were having those discussions at the kitchen table. Visitors feel tension in a church when there is dissension. They walk in the door, they might come once and they leave and never come back because who wants to be part of a community that is under stress and duress and doing infighting? Of course not. They don't want to be a part of that and that's not what Jesus wants for us either. We want to create an atmosphere of safety and acceptance and loving guidance for our kids. And you know, that's the best gift you can give a child. You don't have to give them all the things that are out there, the things that they say they want because all their friends have them. If you can create a life where they are growing up secure, that they know there are adults in their lives that they can trust to always care for them, always tuck them in at night, always make sure they have enough food, always pray with them and love them, then your child will be secure. Now, children in worship, we don't have to allow them to disrupt and disturb, but they need to have that loving touch that helps them understand they're welcome. And here's what we do. 
to sit beside them and distract them. My mom had a glorious array of bracelets with little things I could play with. She'd take it off to me. I'd play with it for hours. There are things we can do to shape our children and to help them and to provide them age-appropriate ways to worship. And sometimes that might not be being in worship the entire time. It takes a village to raise a child. And it takes the whole church working together to create an atmosphere of loving excitement where children are shaped and molded and changed to challenged to grow spiritually. As times change, our ways change. Our music changes, our styles of dress change. But the thing that never changes is the love that Christ has for all of God's children and his desire that we welcome and train up our children so they know for themselves how much they are loved by God. Amen.